As the Cordyceps infection continued to creep its way across the planet, humanity began to become more altered by the passing weeks and months. For those unfortunate enough to be infected early, one trip around the sun would yield a creature much stronger than a full-grown man, and the only real answer humans could produce in self-defense is either running or having a powerful weapon at their disposal. At this point, attacking in hand-to-hand -hand is extremely ill-advised due to the strength and ferocity this former human has. We all saw the thumbnail, so we all know really why we're here. I hope this video clicks with you, let's discuss the lore and morphology of the clicker from The Last of Us and see just how deeply this fungus has affected this person. So as we have continued through The Last of Us, I have pretty much developed a formula for how I structure these videos, so why fix what ain't broke? We will be jumping into the morphology and then work our way internally to see what we can't see and discuss how this fungus has riddled the body with pathways. Starting with the feet, of course, we see actually nothing has really changed, apart from the complete lack of shoes normally. This creature runs around with its standard god given feet. On a note of reality and not so much in-game, this would actually make the clicker quieter as it moves through an area as long as it's not clicking or making screeching noises that it does seem to kind of always want to do. So as long as it doesn't do that, it's pretty quiet. Moving up, we see that the clothing the clicker wears is actually quite ratty at this point. The legs are covered with what's left of pants when they were converted. Again, for a clicker to get to this stage, roughly a year has passed since it was first infected. As such, clearly clothes would not have been changed in any of this process. The legs, if you can see it, appear to be skinned up, but not only that, they also seem to have started growing armor plating that the infected are known for in their later stages. These growths will eventually enlarge, much like that, on the head and cover the body with a thick armor coating. This in turn will lead to its final form, but we will get to that video later on in the series. Moving up to the midsection, we can see more of the fungal armor beginning to grow here. The skin is mostly ashy and the fungus at this point has many fungal veins growing across throughout the abdominal area. Considering the access to the intestines and subsequent nutrients they produce, it would be imperative for the fungus to reach this area to kickstart the quicker growth. The bloodstream does offer quite a bit of nutrients, but there's nothing quite like going to the source. This is why, as you get more distal from the presumed bite of infection, the fungal veins seem to wane a little bit, but as they reach the abdomen, there are many more growths located in this area. Moving up to the thoracic area, we see that the shoulders and chest sport heavy fungal growth. It appears that the infected have sort of a propensity to go for the neck regions in humans, but whether this is by natural compulsion or or driven by the fungus to bite here, it's not really known because it honestly could just be that this lines up where the mouth is for another human to bite another human's neck. But at any rate, because of this bite, fungus introduced into this area gets a solid foothold and grows quite well here. You can expect the shoulders to sport a lot of the same growth and as such, this is not really going to be a weak point. This covering is much like that on the bloaters and to some degree will actually protect it from direct trauma. Moving down the arms, we continue to see a lot of skin being overtaken by the fungus, but not so much as the shoulders. The skin in this area is also to be expected ashy, but interestingly, you would probably expect the arms to be somewhat emaciated as well as the rest of the body after not having a proper meal for so long. But we will get to why this is the case in a few minutes. The arms are astronomically powerful. A female infected reaching clicker status is able to overpower most uninfected males and females subsequently quite easily and help that person commit the not alive. Moving back up to the head, we see a person is nothing what they used to be. Every piece of facial humanity this person used to to possess has been replaced by the fungus. The mouth of this person has seemingly been cracked in half by the pressure of the fungal growth. As such, the front middle teeth have been separated with the top lip completely missing. This seems to be a cleft palate scenario caused by the growing fungus. The teeth are jagged and face more inwards now. As such, they are perfect for piercing tender neck meat. The ears of this clicker are strangely enough present. This may be simply because picking up vibrations of nearby movement has been quite beneficial to this creature and as such has been deemed useful. The functions of the ear might have been allowed to continue for the benefit of the fungus and growth was kept to a minimum in this area. But this is not to suggest that this creature is choosing where to grow fungus and where not to, but as when we see anything with natural selection, those with ears still open and not covered may have been more successful at staying alive and hunting, whereas those who had their ears covered up were not as successful and eventually died off. So the ones with the uncovered ears are the ones that we continue to see up and moving around. Then we get to the thing that's actually fairly hard to ignore up to this point, the fungal growth occupying the nasal, sinus, eye socket, and forehead region. Why did this grow there? Was it on purpose? Well, I think I may have an explanation as to why this creature is sporting this look. All throughout the skull, there are sinus cavities. They exist for the most part to make our skulls lighter, so it puts less strain on our necks. There are open areas lined with tissue and are pretty moist, dark, and warm. I know at least one person watching this is internally cringing right now and hates the fact that I just said moist, and also that I just said it again. Anyways, as the fungus spread, this would have been a perfect location for 
for an explosion of growth. More than likely, these areas would have begun filling up fast due to its natural conditions, and over time, it would have exploded out the front of the face. We see in newer infections that the fungus has begun to overtake the eyes, and this is just the next logical leap. The nose is completely lost at this point, and odds are, it's not so much reabsorbed back into the body, but instead is just grown around by the fungus, or more likely, pushed entirely out of the way. Considering the fungus has changed the shape of the mouth, it's more than likely that it's begun growing out of the nasal passages from the skull as well. This means that the darker opening in the middle may be a direct line into the head and, in theory, should actually be a vulnerability. The fungus has an answer for this vulnerability though, of course, and that's why they're so successful. Again, this fungal tissue is quite hard and will break when met with enough force. Something like a bat could, in theory, break it, but will provide impact compensation. A weaker weapon fired at the head will not penetrate the fungus enough to reach the brain. So essentially, this bloom on its face acts as a second harder skull to protect the brain and fungus vessel. Another thing to note about the bloom is it seems to direct sound. The clicker gets its name, and this is going to blow your mind, from clicking. This clicking is a primitive form of echolocation that will allow it to see up to a few feet away. Much like how the owl's feathers on its face direct sound so that it can locate prey under the snow, this fungal bloom does the same for the infected tracking down humans. It may even still direct some sound to the naturally occurring human ears should they still be around. So with everything we covered, what else is there? Well, fungal progression in the brain, of course. So the general running theme as of late has been that there is still humanity in runners, decreased humanity in stalkers, but the clickers have zero humanity left and instead are reduced to rabid, vicious animals. The thing about runners and stalkers are is that they will still somewhat fight the compulsion to attack humans and even in some cases not attack you outright if you get close. But this fungus has presumably destroyed the cerebrum at this point, either by piercing or breaking of the neural connections or death of the nervous tissue by mechanical pressure. Either way, whatever made this person their human self is no more. To be sure though, the body does still operate and as such parts of the brain must still be active and judging by the location of the fungal growth on the face, the frontal lobe is definitely demolished, which I would direct your attention towards a man named Phineas Gage to see the results. Way back in the day, Gage was a very normal man, somewhat a leader and very level-headed. An explosion actually sent a spike through his brain separating the frontal lobe in some areas from the rest of his brain. For the rest of his life, he suffered from explosive emotional attacks at random and was never the same. He still lived despite the immense damage to his frontal lobe connection and was able to really just get up and walk around like you or I. This is essentially what has happened to the clicker. The rest of the brain is still there in some capacity, although surely riddled with cordyceps growth between the gyri of the brain. The brainstem, cerebellum, and limbic systems as well as the hypothalamus are more than likely still very functional. I would also go on a limb to say that the temporal lobe and some of the parietal lobes must still be viable as this creature relies on sound to hunt. Not to mention, clicking is a new trick for humans to learn. When a clicker begins clicking, the sound is sent out, bounces off an object, and when the sound returns, the brain interprets it. If the object has moved in between clicks, the clicker would then know whatever this thing is, it's alive and it's food. So those areas of the brain carrying the load of interpreting noise would still need to be able to function. The motor areas of the brain, such as the brainstem and cerebellum, must also be altered to some degree as well as the muscular structure of the body. I touched on this a little bit in the stalker episode, but I'll reiterate it here just a little bit. Clickers are strong, very strong, strong enough to take down a human whose body would be pumping out adrenaline into the bloodstream in an effort to stay alive. As mentioned, a female clicker can easily overpower a full-grown man and can take hits that will leave most humans knocked unconscious. This is because the brain is no longer overriding the muscle signals to protect itself. Basically, the Spark Notes version, so I don't repeat myself from the last video, is that our brain limits our strength. This is imperative for our bodies to maintain their usefulness and longevity. This being overridden allows the body to operate at maximum strength and make them much more powerful than your average person. It has been afforded this ability to berserk after losing its humanity and can take down anything it comes across should it get near them. Another thing that I have been thinking about concerning the clickers is the relationship between parasite and human, or I guess really fungus and human. There's a fungus among us. Would you believe that the parasite might not actually be the correct word, but instead symbiote? I do have a reason for this. So as humans, we tend to view our consciousness as the ultimate achievement of animal life. Take that away from us and what's the point? Well, we are still a collection of cells that want to live ultimately and as such, even if we aren't in the equation, our body is still alive. Technically, that's still somewhat of a win for the longevity of our bodies. The fungus plays directly into this. Surely at first, it would invade our bodies and override our brains and take our consciousness, but in return, it feeds our bodies. Much like how at the beginning, humans were more than likely feeding the fungus nutrients by eating others, and as our bodies broke down the consumed tissue, the fungus then returns the favor as food becomes more scarce. Supposedly, the 
the clicker has been alive for roughly a year to reach this point. Its body does not seem to be suffering the effects of malnutrition, but instead appears to be roughly its same size. What has seemed to change is that the body is now covered with a fungal tissue on the surface. This fungi, in return, must be producing glucose for the body to continue working somehow. This has allowed the person to go long periods of time without starving, losing bodily functions, or dropping out from lack of nutrition. Another interesting possibility, because the cordyceps is actually the fungus, might be producing antibiotics in the body, taking over the role of an immune system, seeing as the human immune system would have become quite suppressed after the invasion of the fungus. So if you take a step back and look objectively, this may actually be equally beneficial for both the fungal cells and the human cells, but not for our consciousness or humanity. Although I will say this is extremely short-term gain at the cost of long-term stability, because once these creatures are gone, the fungus will lose the ability to spread with such fervor. Overall, the clicker is a creature who has the ability to berserk, bite, and convert most humans it comes across. The fungal infection has spread so deep in this person that they are no longer human and all their humanity has been lost. As such, they have become stronger, though again, oddly enough, this is really a symbiotic relationship between the two and is much less parasitic than you might think. So anyways, thanks for watching, guys. I hope everyone enjoyed my video on the clickers from The Last of Us. Looking forward to what we might get to see in The Last of Us 2. Maybe some new variants? That would be pretty cool. Anyways, leave a like and consider subscribing if you enjoyed. Also, hit that stupid bell to stay updated. I will drop my Twitter, Patreon, Discord, and merchandise links in the description if anybody is interested in that. And I'd like to thank a few of my patrons. Our astronauts are It's Not a Spoon, Joseph Gibbons, and Laffy No Skill. The two scientists are Artyom Chornage and the Lone Titan. Thank you guys for your awesome support. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you as well. You guys are total ballers. All right, so that's going to about do it for me. I will see y'all in the next one.